Hello and welcome. Let's continue and review week number 11 of dynamics. This week we continued the discussion of vibrations and particularly we started with single degree of freedom vibrations which I want to quickly recap. So for single DOF vibrations we considered the most general case of vibrations of small amplitude. In this case the generalized equation of motion that we derived looked like this x double dot plus 2 delta being a dimensionless damping ratio x, sorry, not dimensionless, it's one over second, it's units, but the dimension, it's a dimension, it's a ratio of damping over frequency uh, x dot plus omega zero squared times x and now we included the right hand side of some forcing function f of t and note that this x can be anything, it's any generalized degree of freedom it can be a displacement, it can be an angle, it can be something but whenever you derive a single degree of freedom equation of motion, and you linearize it about a stable equilibrium, this is what the governing equation of a vibration should generally look like. And we've discussed that these prefactors here can be interpreted, this is the eigenfrequency of the system, and this is associated to the amount of damping. And for free vibrations we discussed the four different cases. Now, with the right hand side, the general solution to this is a bit more complex than what we discussed for a free vibration. In particular, x of t in this case was decomposed into two parts. And we first of all, there could be a homogeneous solution, which is the solution to this equation being zero. And that is nothing else but the solution of a free vibration. Right? This is the solution of a free vibration. That's exactly what we discussed last week. These four cases of undamped, underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped. And then plus here we had our x particular of t, the particular solution. This is the one that is due to the right hand side over here. Now note one important thing, this homogeneous solution, we had seen that this vibrates with omega zero, or if it's underdamped with omega d, or it decays exponentially to zero. So these are the four cases we discussed. What is crucial here is that as time continues, if there's only a little bit of damping in the system, then this solution will go to zero, because any damped vibration will go to zero over time. So as t goes to zero, this solution, the x homogeneous of t, will, oh, not to zero. I'm not sure what's going on with me today. As time goes to infinity, this x homogeneous of t should go to zero, because the vibrations will disappear over time if there's just a tad bit of damping in the system. So if there is damping, then this solution will go to zero, which means this is the only thing that survives, and this is why we call this then the steady state solution, just this part. And that's the crucial part that we discussed in more detail, and in particular we showed that the general solution here can be written as follows. This x particular of t was given by the amplitude of the forcing f hat, or this was f hat times you know, cosine or sine of capital omega t, divided by the eigenfrequency squared of the system times a magnification factor that we called v, which depends on damping, and the way we wrote it, it depended on the dimensionless damping ratio capital D, and also on this eta, and this eta we had defined as being the forcing frequency or the excitation frequency divided by the eigenfrequency. So this excitation over here this guy we had written as f hat times either cosine or sine of capital omega t. And this is the excitation frequency that we're talking about here. And this is nothing else but the amplitude that appears here again. So the first thing we see is that this has a magnification. And this magnification depends on the amount of damping and on the frequency at which you excite the system. It can either be small or it can be huge. It depends on these two numbers. And then in addition, of course, if we excite with a cosine, we're going to get a cosine out. If we excite with the sine, we're going to get a sine out. That's one of the things we showed. We vibrate with the same frequency as the excitation, but if there's damping in the system, we will have a phase shift. So there will be plus or minus phi, where this phi, we define the minus, is what we call the phase delay. And what that means essentially is that if I were to draw a picture here, do it like this. If I were to draw versus time, first of all, the excitation, let's call this f of t. Let's say this looks like this, it's some harmonic function, in this case the sine. Then what I can also do is draw the resultant steady state solution in particular. It will come a little bit later because it's delayed if there is damping, so it may look something like this. 
the delay that we see here, that's exactly the phase delay phi. And another important thing is that there is a difference, of course, in the amplitude, and this difference in amplitude is given by the magnification and this normalization down here. And this is what we call the steady state solution, because this is what survives if we have damping in the system, so this one disappears, so then only the particular solution survives, that's the steady state solution. And, well, both the magnification and the phase delay we have calculated. You can find it in the formula collection. It's just equations, nothing else. Um, one general thing we discussed, namely, if we're below resonance, if we're below eta equals 1, then this phi is less uh, than uh, pi over 2, which means we're in phase, and otherwise we're out of phase, which means in that case, it would not look like this, but if we're out of phase, we would be going you know, in the opposite direction. This is what we call in phase, and this is what we call out of phase. And which of the two ones we see depends on the phase delay, and this in turn depends on d and eta, because we had shown that this phi is also a function of d and eta, and you can find all of these in the formula collection. Okay? That's all we had discussed for single degree of freedom vibrations. Unfortunately, reality is a bit more complex, so we need to also talk about multi-degree of freedom vibrations, and that's what we did in the following. So let's look quickly at a multi-DOF vibration. In this case, we showed that the governing equation that we normally arrive at looks like this. A mass matrix M times X double dot, where again, this is the vector of all generalized degrees of freedom plus a damping matrix, which I call C times X dot, plus K times X. And then, in principle, we also have a right-hand side, which I call F external of T. And this is more or less analogous to what we had up there. This equation and that equation are very, very similar. The only difference is that here X is a vector, because we have many degrees of freedom. And the simplest case that we looked at here, and this is what we did this week, was to look at a free undamped vibration. And if we're free and undamped, that means two things. Undamped means no damping, so the C matrix is identically zero. And free means we don't have any forcing, no excitation on the right-hand side, so we only have the homogeneous solution, which means in particular in this case that the F external of T is just identically zero. And if this is the case, then this reduces to a much simpler equation, because in this case then, what we arrive at is just Mx double dot plus Kx equals zero. And that's the governing equation for a free vibration with multi degrees of freedom if there's no damping and no excitation. Mind that we can derive this in two ways. The first one is, as usual, write down the equations of motion using your favorite method, LMB, AMB, work energy balance, whatnot. Uh, Lagrange, of course, as well. Uh, an alternative is to start with um, kinetic potential energy in the linearized form right away. And then from there derive the equations of motion. We had shown this in class. Uh, that we can also write the kinetic energy T, the potential energy V in terms of X, but I don't want to go here because it's just technical details. The important thing is how do we solve that equation? And this will boil down to an eigenvalue problem, and what we showed in class is that what we need to do is the following. If we want to find out what is the solution to this, then in principle, the general solution that we discovered looked like that. So my X of T was the sum over a bunch of different modes, j from 1 to, I said l in class, is just some number, and then we have some coefficients that we need to determine, times cosine omega j t, let me just write it down, plus or minus phi j, it doesn't matter because phi j and t j are just two constants that we need to determine, times x hat j. Now, let's understand what this is. These guys over here, they're very similar to the general solution that we had for a single degree of free vib freedom vibration. In fact, without this and without that, it would just be a single degree of freedom vibration. Here, this was the eigenfrequency. In our case, we have not just one eigenfrequency, but we have many eigenfrequencies. In case here, the way we wrote it, we have L of those. So these are the eigenfrequencies, frequencies, because there are many of them. And these big here are the associated eigenmodes, because now to every frequency, it corresponds to a particular mode with which the system is vibrating. It could be, if you imagine you have two 
particles. They could be moving in phase, they could be moving out of phase. If you're in 2D, they could be doing all kinds of things, right? And this is what we call the modes, so the mode shapes of the system. Now, we have to find these and those, and the way we do this is as follows. So if we plug this into our governing equation, we arrive at an eigenvalue problem. What we have to solve is this. If we take the determinant out of minus omega j squared m plus k equals zero, this is the so-called characteristic equation. If we solve this for the omega j's, this leads to all the eigenfrequencies in the system. So in our case here, we have an omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, dot, dot, dot as many solutions as we have. How many do we have? In principle, this depends on the size of m and k. And the size of those depends on how many unknowns we have in this vector x. So if you have n degrees of freedom in your vector x, that means these two matrices are of size n times n. And that means that we naturally should also obtain n eigenfrequencies omega squared. In principle, we would obtain plus minus solutions, but here we usually only care about the positive ones. So for all of these, we usually only write down the positive or you know, non-negative eigenfrequencies. For each positive, there could also be a negative one, but we don't just write them down. So here we would have n unique eigenfrequencies. Sometimes some of these eigenfrequencies are zero. That's a very particular case, because if you snuck, plug in zero here, there's no time dependence anymore. In this very particular case, which we discussed in class, we end up with a rigid body mode, which is this is really not the complete solution, because here we take only L eigenfrequencies and modes, and this L is less than N, the number of degrees of freedom in the system. And what we have to do is we have to add our rigid body modes, as we discussed in class. I'm not going to add them here. You can see the equation on the formula sheet. But essentially what happens is if you have a free system vibrating, there can be rigid body modes. For example, two particles connected by a spring. If they're moving like this, the spring is never stretched at all. So if they move in the same direction, there is no stretching of the spring. There's no potential energy involved. There are no forces. It's just the thing is moving as a rigid body. That's what we call a rigid body motion. That's not a vibration. For all of these vibrations, we have a real non-zero eigenfrequency, which is determined from this characteristic equation down here. And once we have the omegas, we can also find the corresponding eigenmodes by solving the associated eigenvalue problem. Namely, we take each of these omegas and we plug it into this equation down here, omega j squared m plus k times xj hat equals zero. That's an eigenvalue problem. And this yields to every eigenfrequency omega a unique vector xj. So for each of these, you would obtain x1 hat, which is the eigenmode associated with omega 1, x2 hat, x3 hat, and so forth. And for each of these guys, we obtain one eigenvector. A second ago, I said a unique eigenvector. That's not quite true, because like in any eigenvalue problem, these are defined only up to a constant. Defined up to a constant prefactor because we cannot find the eigenvector exactly, and that doesn't really matter, because once we plug them in here, the magnitude of these vectors doesn't matter because we put this vector in front anyways. And so these two numbers, the xj and the phij, these are two unknowns, and we have two of those for each eigenfrequency and eigenmode, and we need to find those as usual from the initial conditions. And that's essentially all we have covered this week. I have a lot of free space here. I don't know why I did this. But so we finish our discussion of single degrees of freedom vibrations. And this is what we should know about free undamped multi-degree of freedom vibrations. Thanks and ciao.